Welcome everybody and good morning. Thank you for uh, joining us for our uh, thought leader lecture. I want to first start by thanking everyone for uh, doing so much to keep us safe during this uh, time of crisis. I am very proud of our faculty, staff and students and what they were able to accomplish in the last few months in going online, going remotely, making sure that everyone was safe and continuing our operations. I hope that you're all safe and healthy at home and uh, are going to enjoy uh, our thought leader lecture today. As part of uh, our strategic planning, you may know that we have started a thought leader lecture and bring people who are uh, at the top of their field with great ideas, visionary thinking about the future to campus and uh, to share their ideas with us so we could learn from them. We've had people from coast to coast so far. And of course, being so close to Ann Arbor, we have a, a wide number of people who are at the top of their field in Ann Arbor as, as we do on our campus as well. But today we're very fortunate to have uh, Nancy Love, who I know uh, very well. And Nancy and I share a, a lot of interesting interconnections in the past. And uh, before I introduce her, I'll just go over some of those because uh, Nancy uh, has a bachelor's and master's uh, from Illinois, but then she did her PhD at Clemson with Les Grady. And uh, I studied with Les Grady when I was doing my master's degree at Purdue before he went on to, uh, to um, Clemson. And then Les had a postdoc that worked with Nancy named Bart Smets who we hired at UConn and I became very good friends with Bart. And then Bart and I co-advised a PhD student uh, that went to do a postdoc with Nancy. So we have, uh, we have had a lot of interesting interconnections. And Nancy, of course, I have followed her career because it's been a remarkable and uh, stellar career. She uh, most recently was the AESP Distinguished Lecturer. AESP stands for the Association of Environmental Engineering and Science Professors. So this is an organization of all environmental engineering science professors, uh, science uh, uh, and engineering professors across the country. And she was chosen to uh, go around the country to talk at various universities about interesting topics that uh, she's addressing in her research. And this is a, an honor bestowed only on one individual uh, every year. Um, Nancy had been on the faculty at uh, Virginia Tech for many years. She is widely uh, regarded as one of the top experts in the field of water quality engineering. She's worked on uh, issues that range from PFAS to Flint to envisioning the future of what water is gonna look like in our urban environments. And as you may know, uh, urban futures is a very important part of what we see as our future. And now with this uh, unfortunate crisis, it's even more important to think about what living in close quarters in urban environments is gonna mean in the future. So I uh, do not want to delay very much longer because I know that you are all here to listen to uh, Nancy's terrific lecture. Uh, I do want to turn it over to our Dean of Engineering, uh, Tony England, for a few remarks before we uh, actually hear from, uh, Tony, uh, from uh, Nancy. But I do want to thank you all for making time in your very important days, uh, as, as they may be. I'm sure they're filled differently now that you're uh, socially distancing, but I know that you're very busy as we all are but I'd now like to turn it over to Tony and have him uh, offer a few remarks before we turn it over to Nancy. Tony? Thank you, Domenico. Uh, I first met uh, Nancy uh, when I was Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, ADAA, in the College of Engineering in Ann Arbor. The ADAA, uh, one of the main uh, tasks for them in, in these larger colleges is HR for faculty. So uh, a department, the department that Nancy was in was having some difficulty and she was invited by the Dean to become chair and uh, resolve some of those difficulties. It was a very difficult time, but she handled those problems with a very rare grace. And then even more 
in my mind, more admirable is that she recognizes that the strength of academia is the creativity and, and competence of its faculty and the quality of its graduates, and then chose to pursue that line of academia rather than so, what some of us have done with uh, administration, which I, you know, is important, but I think what she's done just is fantastic. And I welcome you to UM Dearborn and turn it back over to you. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you both, Domenico, Tony. It's really a pleasure um, to be here. And I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing some of my thoughts with you and, and just also uh, thanking everybody for taking the time today out of uh, what I know is um, kind of an unusual time for everybody. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, Domenico said is we need to think about the future. And so that's what this talk is about. But I'm also reminded of uh, uh, George Santayana's uh, quote, which is that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And so my talk is going to take us back into where we, how we got to where we are with regard to urban water infrastructure and systems. And then I'm going to use that as a framework for how we move forward and take the best of what we, we know and what we've done and how we also don't repeat things that I think have, have um, perhaps not resulted in ideal uh, situations. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. All right, so, so good morning, everyone. And, and yes, this is a talk that I'm giving a, a, as uh, Domenico mentioned, I've, I've done a few lectures. I've also done the American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists lecture, the CAPI lecture. And so this is based off the CAPI lecture series. Um, and I have many different partners that I'm listing on my title slide here, uh, including um, the Environmental Biotechnology Group in Ann Arbor, um, the Urban Collaboratory, which is uh, an initiative uh, to bring together different units uh, and I hope you and Dearborn faculty, as well as we kind of build smarter, healthier cities together. Um, and then I'm part of a partnership with Wayne State um, and uh, some uh, partners at UNC, also in Indiana, on water and health infrastructure, resilience and learning. So I'm going to start by talking, I, I think that we have a broad background of individuals on the, on the video today. So I'm going to start by talking about what America's urban water infrastructure cycle is. Um, and you'll find that it's a very um, um, complicated, if you will, multifaceted uh, system. So in any given community, uh, we need water. We need water for a range of uses, in particular drinking and for uh, public consumption. And that water is going to come from a surface source, a groundwater source, or possibly both. And we take that water, we put it through a very engineered system, a drinking water treatment plant, which then delivers water to our home. And the vast majority of Americans turn on the tap and that water comes out, but they really have no idea about the history of that water. And in many cases, don't really know where it's coming from in terms of the water source. Uh, we consume the water and then it goes down the drain or it, we, it goes down the toilet in one way through human waste or, or other uses. Both of those go to a different engineered system called what is a, we've traditionally called a wastewater treatment plant. Um, today, we're turning that into a water resource recovery facility, recognizing the resources in, in uh, what we would call sewage or wastewater. Um, and there also is rainwater is a very important part of the system because it both um, provides water back to the source of the fresh water that we use for our treatment system, but it also can interface with the wastewater plant and actually find a lot of stormwater entering into the sewer that conveys wastewater to the treatment plant. In Detroit, two thirds of their flow is what's called a combined sewer, meaning it brings in stormwater and wastewater together. And being the third largest treatment plant in the world, that's a lot of flow. Uh, sometimes uh, we will take the effluent or the uh, product from that wastewater treatment plant on the liquid side and put it back into the environment as water, but sometimes it'll go straight back or kind of indirectly back into a drinking water plant. That would be called reuse, water reuse, either uh, direct or indirect. Industry is an important part of our communities and oftentimes industry is providing um, water into that wastewater treatment plant as well. It also can use the same sources we use for drinking um, and put water back into those sources 
uh, through its own processing. And we can't forget food. And I'm gonna emphasize that because the food is an important part of our water cycle, not only because of um, the, what we do in terms of creating the food, uh, you know, almost three fourths of the water that we actually use in the United States is for irrigation. Um, but because of the nutrients in those, the food ends up in our water and that it ends up in our, in our water resource recovery facilities and we have to manage those nutrients. So this is a system that has many facets to it. And the vast majority of Americans don't know all these arrows and parts and pieces. And, it, and it's really a, um, an integrated system. The, the term one water is often used to really think about um, how this is all interconnected. So what I'm gonna start with is a, kind of the conventional wisdom that has driven our approach to urban water systems. Uh, in the United States, our systems are what are called centralized and they're multiple barrier. And pulling these two together provides us with efficient systems that are efficient because of their economies of scale. Pulling together a single treatment plant or maybe two treatment plants that serve an entire community is much cheaper than treatment plants at every corner or for every neighborhood, um, given the way that we operate and design them today. It ensures access to water services for everybody. There is a one size fits all kind of approach and they're meant to protect both the environment and public health. I would argue that these features are an essential element of what has led to the economic prosperity that defines the developed regions of the world. And as someone who works in low and middle income countries and with faculty and with uh, uh, others who are, um, work in those countries, I'm familiar with the differences and, and really uh, we do have a lot to owe to these water systems that allow us to have the economic prosperity that we have. So I'm gonna spend a second and talk really about what do we mean by centralized and what do I mean by multiple barrier because these principles have really driven how our systems are designed. So centralization, this one size fits all, is a service oriented approach. The idea being that um, every uh, you know, household has access to the service and the service is you bring all the water uh, from the environment, you treat it, and then you distribute it out to all the houses or the businesses, um, the users. And then when that waste is produced, it all comes into pipes and all comes back to a central location as well. And it gets processed the same way. So in the United States, um, we are heavily centralized. There are about a hundred and just sort of 160,000 public water systems for drinking water in the US. 34% of them are what are called community systems, meaning they operate uh, you know, 365 days a year for about a stable population. Um, and about 80% of us get our water from what's called a community water system, which is where the um, kind of a centralized concept. So it turns out that only about 8% of the treatment plants provide water to over 80% of our population. So that's what I mean by centralization. They're very large systems that serve a lot of people. And we have the same thing on the wastewater side. Um, if you look at the graph, it's actually showing you, um, this is a graph of the percentage of households that are on septic tanks or on on-site systems. So about 17% of US households, about 22 million, are on septic systems. Um, so that means that, again, the vast majority of us are not on on-site systems that are on these centralized systems, over 80% of households and, and the vast majority of our population. So we're very centralized. In terms of multiple barrier, uh, the way this works is that we take you know, water from the environment, we put it through a treatment process, a drinking water process, and it'll have multiple steps in it. And the multiple barrier means we have multiple steps, each step addressing one or more different types of contaminants or pollutants that we're trying to remove from the water. And uh, we really need each step in series in order to achieve the really high levels of removal that we desire and that are regulated uh, to meet. If any one of these fails, we still have the other steps. And we do design for redundancy. So even if one unit fails, there's usually multiple of those units and we have the ability to stay online. We distribute, we, set, we use it, we collect it, and we put it through another multiple barrier system on the wastewater side. 
uh, for both the liquid uh, train and then the sludges that are produced. And then that goes back in the environment and becomes the drinking water for the next community. So this multiple barrier approach is the gold standard of how we operate. And this includes the disinfection at frankly multiple steps in this process, uh, filtration, chemical addition that coagulates, et cetera. So this is very well established. We know how to do this. We know how to do this well. And in fact, it's produced many benefits. So if you look back in 1900 and what Americans died of versus 2015, um, if you look at the third largest, uh, most frequent cause of death was due to waterborne illnesses. I pink out pneumonia because pneumonia is not necessarily waterborne, but there are waterborne forms of pneumonia. And this occurred, if you look back now in 2015, we really don't have any direct waterborne forms of death in the top 10. And this occurred as the population in the United States increased, as you see from 1900 to, this is to 2010. And not only did the population increase, but the percentage of us who lived in urban spaces closer together increased. So as Dom, Dominico referred to, we are living closer together, but our engineered systems have actually provided a service that have allowed us to um, you know, have better protection and fewer illnesses due to waterborne agents. So the systems work well and they've evolved. So I'm gonna use wastewater treatment as an example and you don't need to worry about the specific steps here, but I wanna take you through a history of the evolution of conventional centralized wastewater treatment. So this is on the sewage side. And when we first started really centralizing these systems, some of these systems go back 100 years actually, but in terms of large scale use, um, we really focused on treating pathogens and treating organic carbon. But then as our regulations expanded, we expanded our systems to be more complex and we used that starting backbone and added to it. And so now not only are we removing organic carbon, but now we're converting nitrogen. We're converting nitrogen so that we don't put ammonia in the rivers, which can be toxic to fish and other aquatic species. Um, but these systems are still um, not quite uh, achieving all of the end goals from an environmental standpoint. So if you want to look at kind of a, what would be considered an, an advanced centralized wastewater treatment system that more and more systems, more and more cities might be using is one that not only converts nitrogen, but now it removes it. And it can also recover phosphorus. And so carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus become important part of the nutrient cycles that these treatment plants are involved with. And this is a very complicated system. It's very effective at operating. This is among the most advanced plants that you'll find in the world right now in terms of a wastewater treatment system. So our centralized multiple barrier systems have really created accessible water services that are healthy for the environment and public health, and they've created economic prosperity. But unfortunately, we're really at a point in time where our, our systems are very complex I think the public is generally disconnected from that, what they do and what's required to continue to have them operate the way we want them to. They're largely invisible because we put the pipes underground and we try to make sure the plants are not in the middle of, of our everyday lives and, and people don't see the infrastructure every day, but increasingly this infrastructure is also old and aging. So I'm gonna step through three themes here that are in my title. One is resource efficiency and to understand what that means and why it's important. One is, is access to quality water services and some of the challenges we have in that space. And then community water, public health. I will close then with some, I hope, aspirational future thinking about how we, we think about the future maybe in a different way. So I'll start with resource efficiency and to do that, I'm gonna define resource inefficiency. Now the graphic on the right is very busy um, and I'll talk about it generally, but there's a citation and you're, you're welcome to um, go look at that at a, in more detail. But the point about resource inefficiency relates, uh, what I'm gonna talk about is nitrogen and phosphorus. And there have been several studies that have looked at um, regions or cities and how nutrients flow. The, the vast majority of the nitrogen and phosphorus that enters into our cities comes in the form of food, the food that we consume. 
Um, and you have to think about from, from starting point to plate, you know, from farm to plate, what's going on with the nutrients. Um, there was an interesting study in Europe that showed that if you look at the addition of fertilizer to food in the field, and then the movement of that food to our plate, 10% of the phosphorus that was applied to grow that food landed on the plate, 10%. That's resource inefficiency. We have losses due to runoff and inefficient application of the fertilizer, loss of crop in the field, loss of crop in, in transport to the food markets, uh, and then losses at home where we waste and don't use all that we've bought. Um, there's a similar study in Toronto looking at nitrogen, showing that 65% of the nitrogen that enters into a city, again, mostly in the form of food, goes unrecovered and ends up in the environment. And the figure on the right, it comes from a paper that uh, we published um, uh, just uh, last year um, that is with um, uh, Ming Chu in our School of Environment and Sustainability uh, that for Detroit. And it shows that basically uh, with the systems that were in place, um, then they're actually changing their solid waste handling and how some of the, the nutrients flow there. But that 58% of food related nitrogen and 70% of food related phosphorus in Detroit ends up in the environment in a reactive form. So that's what I mean by resource inefficiency. We are not capturing these nutrients and these nutrients are really important. So this isn't unusual to these cities. This is a graphic from the Water Environment Federation, uh, and I thank Tanya Rausch Williams from Prolo Engineers for sharing it with me, where they're surveying water resource facilities in the United States, and they're looking at the progress of these facilities in terms of resource recovery. And so increasingly, we're starting to look at water reuse and so forth. Biosolids reuse has been, is very um, like prominent, and you do get some nutrient recycling with that. But you can see that from a phosphorus and nitrogen standpoint that our, our, I guess, progress in really recovering phosphorus and nitrogen for uh, direct reuse is still uh, very small and there's a lot of progress to be made. But why do we care? So focusing on phosphorus, um, the picture on the bottom shows Lake Erie, Lake St. Clair kind of system and some of the sediment movement that is commonly uh, happening between those, as well as the um, algal blooms, the harmful algal blooms. Lake St. Clair is in particular affected both by agricultural and um, urban uh, kind of runoff that affects these, these harmful algal blooms, some of which can be toxic and very, um, very bad for uh, just both recreation and drinking water. But phosphorus is a limited resource, it's mined. And the available phosphorus is um, mines are identified on the bottom graph on the right, showing the world uh, resources. And while we have a resource of phosphorus in the United States, the hot pockets of it are in, fairly limited as to where they are. And there are, there are vast parts of the world that don't have access to that phosphorus unless it is imported. Um, and so I would argue that that's, that's something we have to pay attention to. The distribution of phosphorus is where the food goes and we dilute it out in our wastewater, and then we try to reconcentrate it after we've diluted it. And that's a very inefficient way to think about um, how to recover our phosphorus. On the nitrogen side, this is a map again of the world with each of the dots representing what are called dead zones, or these are nitrogen nutrient overload areas that remove oxygen from the, the water and aquatic species uh, can't survive. And so we've monitored these dead zones over time more, so we know more about them but they come about again as a result of nutrient overload. And nitrogen tends to be that limiting nutrient in marine systems, whereas phosphorus is that limiting nutrient in freshwater systems. And so we often think about the Great Lakes not really worrying about nitrogen, we're only really worried about phosphorus, but there's been some work done recently by people at U of M and Ohio State and other areas of the Great Lakes showing a clear correlation. And this graphic shows you on the y-axis um, this is the amount of harmful algal bloom, the toxin that makes them harmful versus concentration of nitrogen. And so there is a correlation, not only in terms of phosphorus creating algal blooms in the Great Lake region, but nitrogen making it more toxic. And so you will see nitrogen regulations starting to happen in the Great Lakes region. And just three days ago, I got an email from someone at Gliwa 
who I've been trying to convince to think about their nitrogen cycles and said, you know what, I, I want to talk with you about this. I actually am starting to understand why this is, is really important for us. Um, and so we'll be doing, we'll be having that conversation. So there are conventional approaches to nutrient resource management. We do them very well. We know how to do this well. We know how to recover phosphorus by these different means I'm showing. And we know how to remove nitrogen from very advanced systems. But these systems are energy intensive. They're not highly efficient in terms of how they work because what we do is when we, uh, re the phosphorus and nitrogen comes from the waste from our use, our households, our toilets, and then we dilute the heck out of it, we send it to a treatment plant, and then put a ton of energy into it only to re-concentrate re, uh, it again. And that is not an efficient way to go forward. I will come back to that at the end. So I want to talk about access to water services and how we got where we are. I'm going to show you a graphic that the um, Congressional Budget Office from data pulled together on how federal funding, funding has been spent on total infrastructure. And it's going to look at some very specific infrastructure, water utilities, highways, aviation, and then all transportation infrastructure. And so red is the federal investment in water infrastructure, building our water uh, infrastructure systems. So what you'll see is that water is treated differently from some of the other infrastructure. And some people would argue, well, that makes sense because water is a regional local responsibility. So back in the 70s, shortly after the Safe uh, Drinking Water Act and the Clean Water Act, there was a very large investment in our infrastructure, but then it was presumed that the up, upgrade, upkeep, maintenance, and, and um, replacement of that infrastructure was borne by the local water um, users through our bills. And maintaining our assets was our responsibility at the local region. And so the federal dollars have peeled off while the local um, dollars are supposed to backfill. So this just puts it in terms of context, in terms of in 2014, how many dollars we spend per capita uh, in terms of federal dollars on water infrastructure relative to other activities. But in that time period, um, we have to think about the, the design life of our water systems. And we often design um, basins and systems within these treatment plants for about 30 to, to 40 years of design life. And we design deep pipe, which moves water from a source into our treatment plants or moves uh, sewage to that's been treated into the environment that it's going to go to, or even deep mains within our city that move water around our city, that deep pipe is often designed for 50 years. So we had big investments in water infrastructure after World War II, and we had big investments in the mid 70s, mid to late 70s. And if we look at where the design life of those deep pipe that might have come in after World War II or basins that were, treat, were put in after the 70s, where we are in terms of design life. We're at design life for a very large fraction of our, of our water infrastructure. So what does that mean? What does that look like? So let's look at US water pipes. This is drinking water pipes in the ground in cities moving water to your house. And if you look at different parts of the country, what these graphics are are percentage of pipe of a, diff of a given age. And the first bar is before 1900, and it goes out to 2010. So in Philadelphia, for example, some 50% of their pipe is older than around 20, 1920. So it's way beyond the time life. Um, and you see some similar patterns in Baltimore, um, but then as you start going south and west, where our cities have expanded more recently and possibly with newer ideas and different ways of kind of uh, different materials and so forth, but they're more recent, the pipes are younger. And so this issue of, of, of water age is not um, homogeneous across the United, I'm sorry, water infrastructure age is not homogeneous across the United States. We have different pockets where some of it's newer and some of it's older. So we have to think about where we live and how our population has moved to think about what that means in terms of water infrastructure. So this, is, this graphic is showing you um, US population changes from 1970 projected to 2030, where blue and the size of the bar indicates the intensity of movement. Blue is shrinkage and orange is growth. So we're kind of moving away from the Northeast and the mid upper Midwest and we're moving South and we're moving West. The centroid of the US population now sits somewhere in Missouri, for instance. 
So then how do you translate all that into um, urban centers? This is a study that was done by a group of urban planners who are looking at this notion of decline, urban decline and urban shrinkage. And they pulled together decline and shrinkage in this graphic. And while you have decline, which is measured as atypical increases in concentrated disadvantage, socioeconomic, um, health, other factors that come into play are these, um, along with shrinkage, which is a sustained decrease in the population. This is looked at over 40 years, so it's a 40 year sustained uh, decrease in population that to make it on this graph. And so the darker spheres in these images, you see this around the United States. It's not just in, in our area. But this orb here in the middle is the centroid of decline and shrinkage in the United States. And it's the upper Midwest, it's the Rust Belt. Um, and so what does that look like? So part of this is not, is, is you have shrinkage in population, you have loss of jobs. Um, but then you also have loss of demand for that infrastructure that we built for growth. If we think about our classes and how we teach our students design, we always design for growth. And we need to design for adaptation. So this is Flint um, as an example. Um, and I'm showing you the Flint River. And this is what's called Chevy Commons. This is where the Chevy used to be built. Big plant, major job, um, you know, source of jobs for the area, um, and also a major demand on water infrastructure. A large pipe supplies the water into this factory. This is that same area today. It's out near Kettering, right there. All right, here's Kettering. And it's, a, it's a, uh, no longer there. The industry's gone, and the demand is gone, and the jobs are gone. So what does this look like? What does that translate to, then, in a city that is shrinking, that has lost um, both the job base uh, and then the population base. So normally a neighborhood would have maybe 20, 30 houses around the neighborhood, around the block. Um, but this is a shrinking city. And so you see that there are many fewer houses. So if we zoom down to the street level, see what that means. And we know our water lines are in the street here. So we've got a drinking water line that was put in in the 50s and a sewer collection line as well. And they're the same size they were since they were designed because we designed for growth. But the only house pulling water off this line is that, that second one there on the left. Obviously, there's no one living in this house. We've got houses that have been raised on this part of the block further down here. So this is the challenge with shrinkage. What happens is our pipes are the same. We have to maintain pressure in them. We've got to push water through those lines. But our demand is way down. And so the water spends more time in the pipes. And that's called water age. And there's a very strong and well-known and established correlation between poor water quality and high water age. So with our Wayne State colleagues in partnership with the city of Flint and some of their contractors, uh, Sean McElmurray and company at Wayne State have simulated and modeled water age in the city of Flint. And so dark green means short water age. And typically, we want our water age to be two, maybe three days, so 24 to 48 hours, maybe 72 hours. So the green is good, and then the yellow starts to get long, and the orange and pink is really long. So Chevy Commons sits down here at the entry of this yellow area, and the water plant's up here in the northeast of the city. And so you see this whole area down here that has very high water age, and in some cases that water age is weeks. It's weeks in the pipe. And so by then you have no chlorine residual in the pipe. When you don't have chlorine residual, you don't have protection against pathogens. We, we know there's a lead issue, but we also have to pay attention to the chlorine. And so prior to the crisis, these were the eight monitoring locations for chlorine that are taken at local establishments like a Burger King or a gas station, many of which are closed right now and can't be monitored. So they have to find alternative locations for them. And you'll notice where the monitoring points are not. They're not heavily in the high water age areas. They're at the extremes of the city because the regulations are driven by what are called disinfection byproducts. We look for those points that are thought to be um, the longest point from the drinking water plant, but in fact, it's not really looking at the hydraulics of the system. So we really have to look at hydraulics uh, and map that out to understand where the problem areas are. And oftentimes cities don't have as good a handle on that as they should. So then how do we take and translate this loss in federal investment 
the need for local resources to invest into what it means at the local level. This is from Jan Beecher, Michigan State, and it shows you the consumer price index for different utilities over time. And the dark blue line is water and sewer rates. And this is some 2014, and this has continued to go up. And what you see is they're kind of, <laughs> you can kind of predict this water rate line from the loss in federal revenue. The rates have to go up to pay for that difference. And as our infrastructure gets older, uh, those rates um, uh, go up even more. And if you're in a city, however, that has lost its jobs and has lost its tax base, this becomes even more amplified. And so that's when water rates go a little crazy. So that's going to move us into community water and public health because we can't disconnect ourselves from the infrastructure itself and the access to the service and the quality of the service and what it, it offers. So the water rate issue is a big problem. It's a big issue in utilities across the country, not just in Southeast Michigan, are dealing with how to handle a lack of revenue. And this is before the pandemic. Um, and you know, consumers or residents, people who use the service who can't pay the bills and can't pay those rates. So it's become common, not just in Southeast Michigan, for water shutoffs. And I'm going to point this out. Uh, it's controversial. Um, but in, uh, you know, in 2018, um, almost 18,000 Detroit households were at risk of water shutoffs. Um, there were there were tens of thousands that, that did uh, have them, less than 20,000 for sure, but in that range. Um, and it's, it's, it's a very controversial issue, but it was also an issue that I think we have to pay attention to. And as engineers who design these systems, we can't just focus on the design. We have to understand how to design for adaptation, how to design for reuse, how to design so that um, cities can manage this asset in a way that um, kind of going forward as we, we, we rebuild our systems. So just before the pandemic shut down, um, there was kind of a controversy that had been brewing underground that came out in public, which was that the, the, there was a point made by several in the state and, and some officials that there's no proof that water shutoffs harm health. I think within a month, we're at a very different place. So now, water shutoffs have become in sharp focus. They've been reversed. There are now rules that are putting people back online. And it's really brought, I think, to the forefront of, of the discussion about this is not the way to handle this asset management problem. Um, and so I hope that this moves us into a new space, um, but I just wanted you to know how we got here, I think, in the case of some cities. It's not an easy solution, but there are solutions that have to be addressed. From also from a public health standpoint, um, this is, now moving to stormwater and thinking about the issue where some cities were built where the stormwater management and the sewer lines were over, overlapping. That's called a combined sewer system. So these, each of these dots represents a combined sewer and um, there are over 700 of them in the United States, cities that have combined sewers. They were built that way. And to undo it and rebuild is billions of dollars, maybe more. So uh, there is a correlation between combined sewers and, and heavy rain events and hospital room visits for gastrointestinal um, illness, as is shown in this one particular study. Other issues relate to how the microbiology of drinking water systems, what we understand about it, is changing, especially as our systems age. So this is uh, the CDC does every five years a reconnaissance of drinking water systems. They're doing one right now, and we've been in touch with them with some of our data from Flint, which overlaps with some things they're seeing around the country. So back in 2003, 2004, uh, what this is showing you is that of the waterborne outbreaks that are known and were monitored, two thirds of them were gastrointestinal, meaning diarrhea or gut discomfort, and, and, and few to no deaths. In 2011, 2012, the next reconnaissance that was done, two thirds of waterborne outbreaks were not gastrointestinal, but they were pneumonia. They were lower respiratory, Legionnaire's disease, with many deaths. And the thing to point out is that we monitor daily for the gut, the gastrointestinal bacteria, and not so much for the pneumonia because our laws have not really caught up with this shift. And it's not that they're necessarily just new bacteria in there. I, I don't know that whether that's the case, but we certainly have, when you have aged infrastructure, you have corrosion and you have iron in the pipes, that plus 
reduced chlorine residual in high water age areas um, are perfect breeding ground for Legionella or Legionnaire's disease. We know about lead. I'm not going to spend much time on it, but I want to point out that it's it's a broader problem across the country and one that is needs to be addressed. So a lot of these issues I'm bringing up on the drinking water distribution system side is um, something that has been written on right as I was starting my Cathy lecture back in September, two EPA officials wrote an article, Deteriorating Water Distribution Systems Affect Public Health. I can tell you that there's a similar article in 2002 and then in 1992. So about every 10 to 15 years, uh, we have an article that talks about how high water age or issues associated with distribution system um, over design or lack of, of maintenance affects water quality, which can affect public health. And the bold uh, elements of this graphic show you the ones that directly affect uh, public health, including lack of disinfection, uh, residual and microbial regrowth. So it shouldn't then shock us that if Gallup goes out and surveys the uh, US um, and asks us about our confidence in our water, how much we're worried about the pollution of rivers, lakes, and reservoirs, or of drinking water, that rarely has that number fallen below 50%. Uh, and in fact, this ends in 2017. They haven't updated this recently, but I suspect it's, it's continued to go back up, not unlike back in, the, in 1999. And it's important to know that there are racial and um, economic disparities in these numbers. So if you break the numbers down according to race and according to economic status, um, non-white respondents had a much higher percentage of concern, and those in the lower economic um, stature also had a much higher concern. And so if you take this and now look at other surveys, this is a national survey from the National Health and Nutrient, Nutrition Examination, uh, looking at uh, the percentage of people from different um, races and ethnicities who rely upon different types of water, so tap water, when you have your Hispanic and um, uh, non-Hispanic black in the middle here, and then other races in the dark black, uh, who rely upon tap water versus bottled water versus sugar-sweetened beverages. Uh, that, that correlates with this lack of confidence in our water systems that are local to where we live. And I think this really highlights some of the, what I call infrastructure investment disparities and, and challenges that we have that are kind of bearing out in other public health ways today. So in 1995, we drank a lot of carbonated soft drinks. We learned that sugar was bad for us. And now we drink a lot of bottled water. And if you look at in 2018, Americans spent a little over $30 billion on bottled drinking water and our annual need just to maintain and fix our current infrastructure is about the same amount of money. So I'm gonna, that's a black screen, it's intentionally a black screen, <laughs> and I just wanna pause and point out that, um, you know, as engineers, and I'm an engineer, I know not all of you are, but we hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public. Um, and the public, it seems increasingly, doesn't seem to believe that the systems we've designed and built are meeting that goal. Um, and there are clear differences, depending upon you know, racial and socioeconomic differences that define who feels protected. So I think that it's really important for us to think about this as we think about how we train kind of our engineers of the future, how we design our water systems of the future, where we go from here, and, and not just doing things to communities, but processes that include the community in that, in that design uh, whole approach. And, and um, we can talk more about that in the 12 to 1 o'clock time frame. So I'm sharing with you a quote that I saw earlier this, it was in February. Um, if you know what the right thing is, you just keep working at it. It seems like a simple quote. This was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And she was um, at an event, and she said that in reference to the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. It was ratified 100 years ago in uh, 1920, after about 100 years of, of 
suffragettes and others who lobbied on its behalf. A hundred years to get the right to vote. I don't think we need a hundred years to, to, to you know, think about changing our urban water system, but I actually think this pandemic is providing us with an opportunity. Change is going to happen and we have to rethink not only how we live, but how we invest in our systems going forward. So I want to kind of move down a path um, uh, that's more positive and thinking about what can this be and what are the new principles we want to think about going forward that achieve resource efficiency access and public health. So what are these enabling principles? I first of all think that our systems need to be more visible and we need much greater transparency around them. We want um, people to be part of uh, the system. 9-11 uh, resulted in the shutdown of a lot of water utilities from the standpoint of public tours. And even today, it's still hard to get onto the site of some water wastewater plants without a bit of effort. And that was appropriate. We have to protect this very important resource. But we also need to be sure that the public is integrated and understands our systems that they're paying for. And so I think that we've kind of gone to one extreme with regard to our water utilities and we need to come back and have a much greater level of community engagement, uh, but also more visibility about our water systems. We need a mindset, mindset shift. As I mentioned early on, we, it's a, it's a um, kind of a service oriented sector, one size fits all. We think of ourselves as consumers of the service of a public sector service. But uh, my, my friend Tom Brad, Bradley at Colorado State introduced me to this term prosumer. Tom works on microgrid, electric microgrid, and the notion that you can you know, use your car as, a, as a, a way to kind of sell energy back or whatever your battery when you're not using your car back into the grid and then you pull energy when you need it. And we, we kind of give and take when we don't need that resource or we can pull power in from our house and then if we're not using it, we give it to somebody else who needs it and then we gather energy or electricity when we need it. We need to think about the same things uh, for other, other public sector services like water. And think of ourselves as prosumers who are putting water back on the grid when we have more than we need or resources such as nutrients. So moving from a service oriented to a resource management, more of a resource management oriented mindset in the public sector service arena. And I think this is gonna take hybrid approaches that still meet the demand at gold standard of multiple barriers. And I'll show you what I mean by hydrogen in a minute. Uh, but to, to have these hybrid systems, there's going to require the use of these cyber physical systems to create reliability and to enable the prosumer mindset. So what does this mean? We're very centralized, as I mentioned, in our infrastructure and almost 90, we're growing to 90% of us living in cities where we have the centralized infrastructure. There's a notion of decentralized where everything's handled at the local level. And that's not realistic either from a public health standpoint. But what we need is a hybrid system, something that borrows the best of each and at different times ebbs and flows as needed. So we may have a little more of our water processing conducted in a decentralized way at certain times or for certain um, types of aspects of the water. And at other times we move more centralized depending upon what's going on. Maybe there's a perturbation. And so this, this vision on the right here may change shape depending upon whether we're relying on the centralized or the decentralized component of the system. And to do this requires these smart cyber physical systems to communicate between the centralized and the decentralized. But also importantly, it makes people become sensors and actuators in the process. So I'm gonna give you a couple of quick examples and then close. So this is Ann Arbor, and we've been working on this idea of how do we get information to users about important water quality parameters. One of those is chlorine residual. For example, how much chlorine residuals in my water to protect me from bacterial contamination. And let's pretend it's a football Saturday. And if all of the users, maybe different people in the community had these little test strips, those who aren't at the game. Um, and the test strip, you dip it in the water, you wait 30 seconds, it changes color, you take a picture and you send it to the cloud. And we're working on this technology with my colleagues listed on the bottom. I'm going to show you a demonstration that is not real data, but um, not too far off from some things that might happen on a football Saturday. And so let's say people maybe do a test strip and over time you get a snapshot of what the chlorine residual is around the city, not just in those locations where someone gets in a truck and goes and measures it, but actually 
you get much more data because now the community is involved and you can crowdsource this information. And green means the chlorine residual is fine, yellow means it's getting marginal, and red means it's not so good. And so there's the, and you can take this data now and kind of make a heat map and see where Michigan Stadium is. When, the, when all these people come into the stadium, our hydraulics change in Ann Arbor. They change dramatically. Um, so Arborland and Michigan Stadium become hotspots that now the water utility has information to make better decisions and consumers have information to know that they should flush the water in their homes. We don't have that right now. Um, and what if Flint had that kind of information when the Flint crisis happened? So this is a, a map of free chlorine in the weeks before the crisis. This is chlorine at those eight monitoring points during the crisis. It's a mess. And, the, and it's very important to note certain locations where they could not get a residual for weeks. This is a two year period. This is a long period of time where it was a mess. And then they came out of the crisis, went back on Detroit water and started to get things back under control. What would have been different if the residents had had um, that information about chlorine residual? We all know about the Flint crisis because of the lead, but people died, and lead's very important, but people died of pneumonia, a biological contaminant that came as a consequence of this crisis. And if you want to learn more about that, I encourage you to go to Frontline PBS, Google Flint Frontline, and watch this episode, and it will help you understand that aspect of the story better. So finally, fit for purpose, this idea that we don't just wait for the centralized system to bring the water that we want, and then we send it all our wastewaters combined, Maybe we use water and we only treat potable water for potable use. Right now, all our drinking water lines are sized for potable water. Uh, they're sized for fire. So we have to have the lines large enough so that we can get enough water in the event of a fire. And all that water is treated to drinking water standards. And that's been important, but maybe there's a different way to do that. I'm gonna focus on the waste side where we, what we produce in our buildings is um, not just wastewater, but you break it down into gray water, black water, and yellow water. And in San Francisco, in the last two years, they've really come around to this notion of fit for purpose. And they now have ordinances where gray water can be collected separately and reused within the same building where the gray water was produced. And gray water is, is hand washing water, it's laundry, it's, it's non, uh, stuff not coming from the toilet, um, usually not coming from the shower. Black water is feces and yellow water is urine. So we have currently, the way we uh, interact with our buildings is we have thermostats and our thermostats are getting very smart and we can have our iPhone or our cell phone and we can turn our heat or air conditioning on or off. When we're not there, we turn it off because we don't wanna spend the energy. We're connected to um, a, a sensor and it, and it can actuate as well. We can program it to do what we want. What's the comparable for water and nutrients? We don't have that, but I would argue that that's what we want. And we want them on a common platform so that the water and the energy and the nutrients, the nutrient energy water or new cycles are all uh, aspects of our living that we interact with, that we, we um, kind of help optimize and make them more efficient because they evolve the way we live. So I'm gonna talk just briefly why yellow water? Why do I care about it? About 80% of the nitrogen in wastewater and um, 60 to 65% of the phosphorus in wastewater and at least half of the pharmaceuticals, if not more, are in our urine. And what we do with it today is we dilute it by, um, you know, from a, uh, about 1% of the wastewater is urine or less. So we dilute it a lot, um, one in 100. And then we send it to a treatment plant and then they pump a lot of energy in and then they might remove that nitrogen, send it back into the atmosphere so that Haber-Bosch can make new fertilizer from it. It's very inefficient. And what if we captured that separately using separating toilets or waterless urinals? And then we processed it maybe at a centralized location by, by conveying just the urine, or we process it in the building, which we're doing in Ann Arbor in our civil and environmental engineering department. And we pasteurize it and we, um, we concentrate it even further and we remove the pharmaceuticals. And then we have to do this in a way that allows people to coexist with it. So we have graduate students in classrooms right near our urine processing room. And in three years, we've had one episode of a complaint where we had the door open during maintenance. 
So we figured out how to do this at the building scale and SMART. This is operated in Vermont, sitting in Michigan. So the, trying to do the hard thing and learn from it so that we can expand into other applications. Not that this would work everywhere, but it could. And you can follow us on Twitter, Yuri Nation, Yuri Nation, Yuri P Nation, you get it, is our, has a Twitter handle and he talks about nutrients. And in terms of people's perspectives of this, um, given a little bit of information that's appropriate for a broad range of reading levels, we have found, interestingly, that while we all love organic fertilizers, interestingly, when they learn a little bit about biosolids or urine-derived fertilizers, they're more willing to, people are more willing to consider that over synthetic fertilizers, which is where most of our food is produced from. So I'm going to close by saying I've told you a lot of things about our systems, but I think there are some really important options here. And I also think that as academics, um, myself, I've started, and I see uh, Dominique's been doing this, um, Dominico has been doing this too, is writing publicly about who we are and what we need to do and how we, um, the role we play in society. So I've written some pieces on confidence in water and what it's gonna take to get there. I don't talk about safety, I talk about confidence because safety gets interpreted different ways by different people. We've talked about educating people about what water age is and why it's important, working with people in public health. And so I would challenge us all to think about engaging in public communication so that we can make this more transparent and achieve resource efficiency with new systems going forward Equity and access to resources needs to be at the core of that. Enhanced environmental and public health with our systems talking together and education um, on communication um, with communities. So I'm gonna close and, and just acknowledge that this is the work of, of many, many people, both at the University of Michigan, Wayne State, the Richard Institute are our partners on the, the resource recovery work um, and the uh, American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists who gave me the resources to pull this talk together. And I'll pause at that point. Thank you. I think I'm supposed to pull up the Q&A. I don't see any questions, but I welcome any, or we can uh, thank you. And, and um, I know this is recorded, so it'll be available for others that I can always take uh, questions uh, offline. I'm sorry, I think my audio went out, so that's why I couldn't hear you. I'm turning it back on. Okay. So I think I hear a um, question about PFAS. Um, you know, I think <laughs> there, there's a lot to be said there, and it's, it's obviously an issue that um, we're going to be dealing with for some time. And I um, think that you know, I, have, I actually have not been doing as much with PFAS. I know that I have colleagues who have been. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been working, let me kind of move my slides out, I suppose. I'm not sure how to, I've got to get myself back. Give me a moment. <laughs> um, I stopped sharing, that's what I'm gonna do. There we go, okay. Um, yeah, you know, I, I've, um, I think it's really kind of in the understanding stage at this point of how broad of a problem this is and, uh, in Ann Arbor itself, you know, we've, we've been struggling with this and we have a very high-end utility that is, has a lot of interaction with the public and still got kind of uh, blindsided, if you will, by uh, PFAS information and, and so, uh, and how much we have and so forth. So I, I, we're still learning, we're, we have technologies to remove this at the drinking water level and it's costly. Um, so, 
you know, I, I actually have also looked at kind of the point of use of, of approaches to PFAS, and um, there are a lot of them that are not very effective uh, when it comes to the typical kind of low cost point of use filter. You really need reverse osmosis. <laughs> And that's uh, not getting everything, but it's getting most of the more toxic forms that we're concerned about. And not everybody can afford that. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily the right solution either. Uh, so so we're, we're really in the learning stages and the technology development stage. I know people who are looking at um, more advanced oxidation approaches uh, to try to address it. Um, so that's thinking of it from a technology standpoint, but I do think kind of in concert with this notion of transparency. We have to be able to talk about this stuff. If I've learned anything in the last five years and some of the interaction with the community work is that the community um, needs the truth, they can handle the truth, and that we have to learn how to discuss this with the community so that they can be part of that process of discussing it. Um, so I don't know which order these things came, questions came in. I see one that says, um, uh, systems to be managed by uh, the tendency of water systems to be managed by elected township officials in rural townships. How are these types of officials educated? That's very interesting. I just had a phone call yesterday um, about this issue. I've been talking with an alum who came to me with the idea of kind of school for elected officials. So there are, when people are elected, they do go through school um, about budget and different ways of running their communities. But I don't think we have a really good package for the public sector services so, and, and the water systems being among them. And so we're starting to look at what are the kind of uh, materials we can develop in terms of uh, that kind of a curriculum for elected officials. They're not going to become experts, but if they understand the complexity of the system and where to go to get uh, good information about it, to know that it's not simple, that it's not a one size fits all, you just put a treatment plan in and they all work the same, um, that, that would have prevented, I think, some crises that we've experienced. Um, and so I think we, people like myself, need to uh, be able to help provide and develop that, that curriculum with those who can help make it accessible. Um, and so I, I agree with you. I think that's a very important aspect. And I, so, and the conversation was with the Michigan Water Environment Association, and I know the Water Environment Federation and the American Water Works Association are understanding this need. Um, you know, albeit late, but I think uh, we really need to get out there and, and provide that service. And the slides available, I think they'll be available. This is being recorded and I'm gonna put it on my website as well. So, um, so that yes, the slides will be available. Um, so let's see, lack of bottle, lack of access to bottle filter water may be a contributor to health problems that created a high percentage of persons of color being affected uh, with COVID-19. I think there are multiple factors. I think some of the factors that I just put up there are overlapping with other, um, other infrastructure related kind of issues that, that uh, make people vulnerable, air pollution, you know, I think, and respiratory aspects, I think is still being discussed as one of the uh, factors that make people vulnerable. And if you're living in parts of the community where the industry is and where you have more air pollution, but those also have, tend to be the locations where the water infrastructure, uh, infrastructure is, um, you have your upgrade investment disparities, your lack of upgrade, or maybe the community is shrinking and not as where the same size it was, and so you have these high water age issues. So I think they overlap. Um, I don't. I don't know. I have colleagues who are looking at. I, I've been studying uh, coronavirus for the last five weeks. I've learned a lot uh, working with the hospital on PPED contamination. So I've learned a lot about how it dies, and it is a wimp in water. I just want everyone to know that is is a virus. They may find RNA, but that doesn't mean that it's infectious. There's still a lot of work being done on this, but um, we, we know that about it. And, and when it's dry, that's when it might be more um, resistant. And so uh, that's what I can tell you what I know. Um, but I agree with you that some of these things overlap in terms of people who, who experience these um, access inequities are multiple inequities and that can translate into environmental pollution of different types that may make us vulnerable. I'm not an expert in that, but that's, that's my hunch. Um, 
Composting toilets. Okay, so I just want to make it really clear. When I talk about urine separation, it doesn't have to be a composting toilet. I just want to make that clear. You can have a composting toilet with urine separation. And oftentimes you want to move, remove the nitrogen and phosphorus because the nitrogen can sometimes complicate the efficiency of composting. And so, um, you, so those can be separate. Um, and so the question is, what are your thoughts on composting toilets to keep human waste out of the water system altogether? Um, so there are, uh, the Solaire in New York is a very high-end building that has its own waste system in the basement. Um, and it converts uh, the black water into energy. Um, and so I would argue, well, let's remove the urine. And so you have black water going for energy and the urine going for nitrogen and phosphorus. And so I think that I, we're always going to want the centralized, well, let me say this, the centralized system, the way I see it, can focus on carbon and not just carbon to remove the contaminants, but to re, reuse and produce byproducts and co-products useful for industry. So turning it into a factory, if you will, for material reuse is there's a lot of work going on in that space and understanding of how we can do that. There will still be some residual waste, but it will be a lot less. And then if the nitrogen and phosphorus also get processed for reuse uh, for fertilizer, and there's so much more of that that we can absolutely recover and reuse, um, then I think we still have our need for kind of a centralized system, if you will, because I, I don't, there, there's benefit from a public health standpoint to moving that stuff out of our buildings. And it's not necessarily cost effective for everybody to kind of do an on site local treatment. Um, uh, but I do think a combination is, is relevant, and we have to look at the application. Um, and so composting toilets can work very well. Some of the best bathrooms I've been in have a composting source separating toilet, um, because if you design it the right way, it'll work. Um, but again, from a cost standpoint, we have to look at the applications uh, of where that makes sense. And as we build our infrastructure, kind of going into the next 50 years, I think that we need to build it now because we designed for 30 to 50 years, right? And, and so new high rises, new developments. There's one in Ann Arbor here where they're looking at urine separation. I've been contacted now, not only by Detroit, by New York City, um, Denver, and Paris is looking at this. So it's, it's real. It's really an option that people are considering. Um, shut me off when I have to stop, <laughs> time-wise. Um, Let's see, shouldn't we tie these advances into our education system so the kids learn about our science and engineering in a way that relates to these practical aspects of life? Many college students believe groundwater is a system of rivers underground. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Um, I, I, I do some stuff in K through 12 and, and, um, and it, it definitely takes rethinking how we talk about um, our work. But I also think from where I am as a college professor, I've been thinking a lot about the education side and how we not only train environmental engineers and water quality engineers, but how we train engineers um, to rethink how we do design. We, do, we, we tend to do design, I think, from a very engineering-centric perspective. And I think that there are ways to really build a capacity of engineers to use socially engaged design principles uh, that really understand the user and give the user kind of um, kind of involvement in that process in ways that we don't do right now, and that that needs to be a core part of our education. Um, so, you know, I've been working on some of these aspects and learning in the process. Um, uh, but I, I agree that that there's more of a need. I've I've tended to focus at the college level and at this public uh, official elected official level. And then in my kids' classrooms when I've done it. And even when I, I worked on fourth grade, they do water here, at least in Ann Arbor. I think that's a fourth grade across the state of Michigan. They do a water um, kind of uh, sector, a section of, of their of learning. And when I went online to look on YouTube at what was available for kids, it was like not only wrong, technically wrong, <laughs> but not, not accessible. And so I've, I've started to develop some of those things. I'm, and I agree with you, uh, getting this out in a public way uh, for everybody to have is, is important to do. So last comment here from uh, Laura. Um, Laura, I really appreciate your focus on transparency and communication with the public. What kinds of training do you recommend for engineering students and further training for professionals to communicate effectively with the public? 
and through what processes, um, such as working with public officials and urban planners, more directly to media. Well, this has been a learning process for me. I, I've, um, I've actually, you know, I, at the university, we often have resources. I know uh, that, that you do at Dearborn um, and we do in Ann Arbor. Uh, when I've had my students work on projects that actually involve kind of interacting with the community, um, and I try not to get out too quickly on that. I, I'm very conscious of the privilege that I have and um, that I come at it with a, through a lens. And so I, I have to learn how to listen. And sometimes the students are so ambitious and they want to get out there and fix a problem. So I put them through a training program at the Ginsburg Center before they ever step foot in the community. And even if they do that, um, like we did a, a point of use filters. It was a big part of a study we did in Flint looking at the microbial growth in the filters and what was happening in these high water age areas. And it was it was an important issue because it was it was a problem, I think, for quite a while until they started to raise the, the chlorine residual in the city and still have pockets where there's a problem. Um, but we did, a, we developed a train the trainers program for how neighbors could train other neighbors. It was, it came to us from Flint. We didn't come to them, they came to us. We worked with them to develop the curriculum in a language and in a way that was accessible for the public. We then worked with uh, public health officials in Flint to develop that further, go through the training a few times and hand it off. So the students were involved as hands-on kind of working on this, but the goal was always to hand it off and it's been handed off. Um, we're working now on Spanish transla translation and hearing impaired translation. And uh, Benton Harbor community has had a need and they've used this, this tool and I think in Milwaukee and other places. And so it's on the web. Um, we're trying to make it uh, more accessible and with some videos. But my point is, is the students were part of this every step of the way, but they learned to, as, as I learned to, you know, it's, it's not about us. <laughs> uh, it, you know, we're in, in that case, we're in service to the community. And, um, and so we had to go through a process that exists. A lot of these tools exist on our campuses, but engineering, it's not a common overlap with engineering. And then also for our freshman engineering class, we've actually brought in anthropologists who talk about working in communities and uh, in, in service of the public good and, and what that means and how it can be perceived and what alternative ways one might have to approach that within a community. So I think starting those conversations early with freshmen is important and then you know continuing to um, keep that as part of our, our curriculum going forward. We all have a lot to learn, I think, from colleagues who've been doing this for a long time. I will, I think that's it for the questions and I think we're over time, so I appreciate it. Thank you all very much. I really uh, appreciate the opportunity and, and we will see these flowers very soon. Uh, I think it's, um, it's rainy here today, but the weekend's supposed to be nice. Uh, at least here in Southeast Michigan for those who are in this region. Um, but I wish you well. And um, I guess that's the end. Thank you.